things here. What happens when you begin to walk for a long time though, and you don't have anything to drink? You get thirsty. And we're going to add only one thing tonight to our backpacks. That should excite you. Usually we've been putting three or four in as we're, we're getting these lessons. We're adding one thing to our backpack tonight as we're on our journey. We're going to add a water filter. Uh, years ago, if you were going to go camping or, or kayaking on a river that was desolate, you would have to pack in your water, which was very heavy. You would either have to pack it in or you have to use terrible tasting iodine tablets. They leave a interesting aftertaste for you. I, I recently, uh, just back in April, just a few, few weeks back, I had the opportunity to go out into deep Southwest Texas, Del Rio, Texas, and I was able to spend three nights and four days on the Devil's River, right? The preacher in the Devil's River, jokes about it. But we were out there and, and you know, we brought these little water filtration straws, about this big. I can literally bend over and drink out of the river itself through that straw. It is a filtration system that allows us to, to filter out the bad things, the bacteria in that river, in the water. As we're going to read in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, we're going to see it. It's mainly brought up and, and preached on through marriage. But notice what is said in verses 32 and 33. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Do you see it? Verses 22 through 31 have to be filtered through the lens of Christ and the church. We're adding that water filter to our backpack this evening. As we begin here, verse number 22, it says wives. Now, before we get into the text, many have a skewed version of submission today, don't they? We have a, a skewed version of it overall. There are those today that say, well, the Bible is outdated in its teaching. It doesn't match up with the, the progress that we have made. Friends, I would say that those who hold to that view have not read the Bible in their entire lives. Because when we filter these verses through Christ and the church, it becomes very clear what's being said here. Within the church, we are to submit to the head of the body, Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. But the text reads, Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Right off the bat, we're going to see a glimpse here of a relationship. It's between a Christian and the Lord. You submit yourselves to the husbands as to the Lord. There has to be something we see further, see past. It's not that the husband is better than or, or over. He's not a dictator towards his wife. He should not be. But this is it's a loving response from the wife to the husband. As she would have a loving response to God, the father. You see, as a, as a husband myself, I can tell you that I am not always what I should be to my wife. I, I, I struggle. I, I fall short. But the way that she treats me because of her love for the Lord has bolstered my our marriage. It, it, it lets me see things clearer. But you know what's beautiful? When we look at the idea of marriage and, and the uh, marriage between husband and wife, but also the bridegroom and the, and the bride, the church being the bride and Christ being the bridegroom, Christ as the husband never fails. That is the beauty that we're going to see here in verses 22 and following. God has given those marital roles all the way back from the very beginning. You're going to leave mother and father. You're going to cling to one another. But verse number 23 continues there in Ephesians chapter 5. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. We need to be keeping that in mind as we are filtering these verses through Christ and the church. It's not just about wives submitting themselves, but also a relationship with us as the church to Christ. We have to see that in the book of Ephesians. Ultimately, wives are going to submit to their husbands because they want to please God. But again, this is not saying that husbands are perfect by any means, nor should they lead in a manner that is contrary to what, what God would have them to do. But friends, Christ is worthy of submission. God the Father is worthy of submission. 
And as we continue to look at the husband and wife relationship here in Ephesians 5, our desire should be to submit to one another so that we can be pleasing to the Father together. That is what we're going to see here. He continues there in verse number 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so that wives be to their own husbands and everything. Verse number 25, it, it, it's not that it's only wives have to be submissive. It's talking about husbands here too. Husbands, verse number 25, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. We do ourselves a, a disservice when we look at submission this way. Well, if I have to submit to someone, then that means they're, they're better than me or, or nobody's going to tell me what to do. We're hurting ourselves. Brethren, that's a dangerous thought process. Those of you who are who may be in junior high or high school or up and coming in through your grade levels, that thought process will ruin you. It's ruined many before, but, but it's not just the kids that are affected by it. As adults, that thought process is dangerous. We must be careful. Ladies, wives, notice here in verse number 25, the weight of the responsibility that lays on the shoulders of a man, of the husband. The man is to lead his wife in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Why? Because the husband is also submissive to Christ. Just as the, the, the bride of the groom is submissive to her husband. We see exactly how much Christ loved the church in the latter part of verse number 25. And he gave himself for her. We need to reemphasize this. Men are not perfect. Husbands are not perfect. We fall short of that type of love, of that type of service constantly. But our challenge is this. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Leadership means service. In all acts of leadership, it needs to be service. Not, not lording over, but working alongside. As a leader in the workplace, we must know how to lead in order for those working under us to desire to work with us. Usually the best way to cultivate that is to show them. Work hand in hand with them. If we as leaders are not serving first, then those who are who are working with us are not going to want to. They're not going to want to work. That applies to the home specifically here in Ephesians five. It's the context is going to pertain to husband and wife. We need to be with those who are working together for the goal of heaven. That's going to require us to humble ourselves. And that's difficult sometimes, isn't it? Men, we need to be those who are willing to give ourselves for our wives. Just as Christ himself gave himself for the church. When we think about Christ and his coming to purchase the church, that was his entire purpose, wasn't it? He came down and shed his blood so that we could be bought back to be redeemed to the Father. Christ had to shed his blood on the cross so that we may be sanctified, that we may be cleansed. Verse number 26. And as leaders of the home, our responsibility is to lead in such a way that accompanies, that, that benefits, that encourages our spouses. Man, if, if we are not serving our wives the way that Christ served the church, do we truly love her? Think about that question for a minute. Do we fall short far often or far more often than we should? Our leadership in the home should be of mutual benefit. And our spouses' lives, they should be better because of our leadership. Not that we are better than them. Not that we have more worth than them. But that we love them so much that we are striving to show them the same sacrificial love that Christ showed the church. But notice that the text doesn't only read wives submit to your husbands. Where society today may read that and stop and they say... Well, see, the Bible's outdated here. The wives are, are just as important. Amen. Wives are just as important as the husbands. But there is a marital role to be played in those roles. If, if they would continue reading, they would see that men have that tremendous responsibility laid upon them. 
And the decisions that they make with their wives are going to affect their marriage. We should make that choice easier for our wives, men. And we should have them be desirous because as leaders in that relationship, we should be first submitting to Christ. And if we are properly submitting ourselves to Christ, then our wives are going to want to submit to us because we're leading them towards heaven. That is the goal. Look at verse number 27. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, they, but that she, excuse me, should be holy and without blemish. How do we treat our wives? Men? How do we treat them? Not just when we are with her, but when we are around friends or around co-workers, how do we talk about them? Are we presenting her like Christ presents the church? Are we holding her up in high esteem, presenting her as, as glorious, one without spot or blemish, one without wrinkle, or any such thing like that? Do we present her as holy before people that we come in contact with? This is my wife. I love her. Christ says that for the church every day. Paul is going to follow up. Excuse me. Paul is going to follow up in verses 28 and 29. So husbands, you ought to love your own wives as their own body. But he who loves himself, or excuse me, he who loves himself loves his wife also. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. The two are one. Remember, we have become one flesh as husband and wife. Husbands, we should want the best for our wives and the wives, they should want the best for their husbands. Our marriage is going to function best when the man is respected and submitted to the way that honors the Lord. And the wife is going to be loved by the man when he loves Christ's church the way that Christ loves his church. When we love our way, when we love our wives the way that we love ourselves, who does that benefit? Both of us. There is something that needs to be done there. There needs to be a mutualistic relationship where both parties benefit from doing what God would have us to do. We're one flesh, verse number 31. And as that one flesh, we look back at verse number 29. No one ever hated his own flesh. No one ever hated his own body. We take care of ourselves, don't we? We want what is best for ourselves. We must look at our relationship with our wife the same way. We care for, we love, we nourish our spouse because it's unnatural not to. If you are now one flesh and we are, it's unnatural to not love your wife the way Christ loved the church. You say, well, what, what, if, what if our spouse does not treat us the way that we should be treated? It's a fair question. Verse number 30 reminds us, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And therefore, as members of the body of Christ, we still must fulfill our roles. Wives being submissive to the husbands and husbands leading the wife in a worthy manner, even if our spouse is not fulfilling their role. This quote is not original with me, but I want to read it. What God commands of us, whether in our marriages or, or our individual lives as Christians, does not hinge on the response we get from other people. We still have a duty to obey God, no matter what's going on around us. Christ, he makes sure that the church is taken care of, that she has what it needs. So husbands, here's that question again. How do we treat our wives do we ensure that she has all that she needs? Wives, do, do you ensure, I almost said, do we? <laughs> that doesn't work out. Do you ensure that our hus that your husbands, I did it, that our husbands, mm, let me step back for a second, take a drink of water. Do you treat your husbands in a way that fulfills his, his needs as well? Not so much physical, but the idea of working together towards heaven. Do we meet those together? Man, we have a role. And that role is leading. But that leadership means service. 
Serve your wives. Serve your husbands' wives. What about, what about low-quality marriages? If, if we are not effectively completing those roles that God has given us as husbands and wives, and we have some room to grow, don't we? We always have room to grow in our marriages. Do you know any couples that have been married 20, 30, 40, 50 years and they seemingly can't stand each other? They're still married, but they don't. Their marriage is not great. It's not enough just to stay together. God wants us to be, he wants us to thrive in our marriages. We look back at Ephesians chapter four, verses 25 and following there. You're going to, to put away lying and you're going to speak truth in love. We're going to steal no more and you're going to now labor so you have something to give to those in need. You don't have any corrupt word coming out of your mouth. We should be those who are, are only speaking the things which are good and necessary for edification. We're letting all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking to be put away with. You're being kind to one another. So let, let's take that in verses in chapter 4, verse 25 and following, and let's apply it here as we're filtering through 22 and following of chapter 5. Let's take that to our marriages. Wives, don't just submit to your husbands, but have a terrible attitude about it. Husbands, don't just love your wife as the world would call it love. Love your wife as, as Christ loved the church. Present her as pure and holy, without blemish, glorious. Cherish and nourish one another in your marriages. Strive to thrive in them. Looking at verse number 31, for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The reason that these things are being spoken of, spoken of in verses 22 and following is marriage. Going all the way back to the garden, Genesis chapter 2, God has spoken these words to Adam and Eve and ultimately looking forward to Christ and the church. It was a type, the relationship that was going to be taking place. We think about chapter 3 and the, the mystery being revealed so what is it that we're filtering out here in verse number 32? This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular shall love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You see, we're filtering these things through Christ and the church. But Paul throws it in there. But don't you forget to apply this to your own marriage. We must be a people that are seeking after the things of God. Now, as we are going to, to flow into chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we're still only putting in our water filter, but it, it applies through this. And it's going to actually go through verse number 9. But looking at the relationship between children and parents here, chapter 6, verse number 1. Perhaps chapter 6, verse number 1 is a memory verse that we teach our children. Stella could probably quote it, not right now because she's sleepy. But she could quote it. And it is a humbling thing to hear our children recite memory work. It's humbling because I don't do enough of it. How much memory work do you do? How much memory work have we done in the past year, in the past five years? Memory work is, is great for our minds. It keeps them sharp. But you know what, what happens when we put it in our memory? We put it on our hearts. When we're able to draw on those, those scriptures that we've studied and memorized, when we have a, a tough time and we go, you know what, that sounds like this verse, and we can recite it in our heads, that does leaps and bounds for us when we come into temptations. Memory work is important. Don't sell yourself short on it. It was interesting. Um, I guess it was back early 2020. We, we did a what we called a family Bible class but I was teaching ages newborn to their parents. And when I told everyone that you had memory work, the parents go, oh, I have memory work? That yes, if, you're, if your child can learn it, you can learn it. But yours is actually gonna be longer than your children. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, they have to learn a little snippet. You have to learn Genesis 1, 1 through 3. Memory work is beneficial for us, friends. We can do better. But children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Most of the time, 
Whether parents are Christian or not, parents want the best for us, don't they? Most of the time. They want to lead us down a path that will keep us safe and steady and successful. So what is it that this verse is saying? Do, do children need to obey their parents even if they're, what they're doing is going against God, against His commands? We look back at chapter 5, verse number 25. Husbands are to love their wives even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her. So let's take that thought process here. Remember, we're still using that water filter. Let's place it in, in the parent and child relationship. Do we want to give ourselves for our children? Are, are we truly loving them as Christ loves the children? Jesus loves the little children. The song that, that so many uh, would only pin as, as a children's song. Maybe we would do better to sing that in the assembly. We need to be there for our children. But let's get back to the question following. Uh, even if our parents are inconsistent with the things of God, should we obey them? Our responsibility as a father is not, or excuse me, our responsibility to please the father is not void due to a response or action of someone else. So that is going to apply to children. Yes. Our prayer is that Children would grow up in homes where parents are encouraging and loving and, and they cherish them and they point them towards heaven. But sadly, we know that is not the case for many today. And yet, because there is an authority figure over them, they are to obey their parents in the Lord. It's not that their parents are necessarily in the Lord, but that, that the children are growing up to respect that authority Remember that these verses must also be looked at through the filter of Christ and the church. Because when we read the word children, often our minds, they put them as 18 and under. But when we, when we use that filter, what is that going to bring out to us through the book of Ephesians? Remember that the Gentiles in, 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 excuse me, Gentiles in Ephesus, who were once strangers but now citizens, they were once foreigners and now they're saints. They were adopted as sons. In chapter 1, verse number 5, we see they are children of God. And with that in our mind, they obey their father just as we should. The Gentiles should obey God just as we should. Verse number 2 continues to give the quote, chapter 6 of Ephesians. Chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians, verse number 2, is going to give us a quotation from Exodus 20. Verse number 12, honor your father and mother that it may be well with you and you may live long on earth. Isn't that most parents' goal? That their children may live long lives? Certainly that they would outlive them. But why would God point our minds back to the Old Testament? Remember, the Gentiles were once separated from God. They, they did not have the law. But now as children of God, he's telling them about the things he had always intended for them. Children, obey your parents to the Lord, for this is right. God wants the best for his children. And he has given those in Ephesus, contextually speaking here, and us today, the necessary things to understand what he desires from us in obedience towards him. God is a fantastic father. He is the, the ultimate, if you will. He's not going to fail us. He's going to show us the love that is needed by all fathers. But look at it as the text follows here. Verse number four, there's a, another charge towards the men or the fathers here. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Really here, it's not only the fathers, because the, in verse number two of chapter six, it says, honor your father and mother. We're looking at, at the idea of parents, if you will. But men, we have a, a grave responsibility to lead our households well. It's of, of utmost importance. How are we doing? It's, it's difficult to raise children. People ask me all the time, is it scary? Absolutely. It's terrifying. But it is the most rewarding thing that I've ever done. All right, Scott, reel it in. How are we treating our children, 
our wives, with our, how are we treating our wives in our marriages? How are we treating our children with our relationship with them? Are we treating our wives like the bride of Christ? Chapter 5, verse 27 through 29. But when, we, when it comes to raising children, what do they know about us, men, as fathers? They know that well, daddy, daddy goes to work and he comes home and he puts his feet up and mama does the dishes and she cooks and cleans and really does everything else around the house. Or is it that daddy really takes time to, to help mama? That he takes time to, to go push me even after a busy day at the office or whatever it may be, to, to, to push them on the swing, to, to ride on a bike, to, to play a puzzle. Maybe they should just sit and listen to their stories that they have created in their wonderful minds. This verse can be applied once again to mothers as well. Don't miss the, the flow of the roles here. Parents, we have a responsibility. Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. We are not to provoke our children. And that's not... <laughs> That's not them becoming angry because we told them no. Right, David? <laughs> it's not them becoming angry because, because they don't get what they want. It's not saying you cannot have this and so that they, they throw a tantrum. No, it's purposely driving them to anger, pestering them, continuing to, to, to push them down a path, trying to gain that angry reaction from them. No, we are to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. A great, great chapter on parenting. How to raise children. But they need to be brought up by teaching. Our children do. It's not always that swat on the rear end. It's not always the rod of corrections. At times, absolutely necessary. But let me present this to you this evening. And if it doesn't sit well with you, we can talk later. The times when we feel like we should do the admonishing right then and there is probably the time that we as parents need to take a step back and say, am, am I angry right now? Remember, we've already talked about anger does not lead to good things. That's not to say, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's not to say that we do not admonish them. Please, don't misunderstand. But when we are, ourselves are angry, the decisions we make are not always the best. Something that, that we try to do, that I really try to do, my wife has far more patience than me, and I will admit that openly, is I, I try to take a step back and, and then think about why it is that I'm going to punish Stella. And I try to ask her beforehand, do you know why you're getting this spanking? That's helping me as a father train my child. Why it is you're getting that spanking? And then once they understand, she gets the spanking. That's just me. We can talk about parenting antics after this, if you'd like. But it's not always that admonition. There has to be instruction, too. But it's not one or the other. It can't always be instruction and no correction, but it also can't be all correction and no instruction. There has to be a balance, and we need to find it. We should desire to find it because when we filter these things through Christ and the church through Scripture, doesn't God have a balance in the way that He treats His children? Admonition and teaching. We need to be careful, friends. God certainly does not provoke his children to wrath. More supplemental verses on this would be Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. And then as we flow into the end of our sermon here, looking at, at bond servants and their relationship with their masters, still using that water filter, certainly a, another scripture, or excuse me, another section of scripture that today's society would read and claim that, that God loves slavery. We must be mindful. We need to put ourselves in, in the, the shoes of the people that's being written to here. What was going on in that culture? Bond servants and slaves, they were, they were common. We've said it before and we'll say it again. The responsibility of the Christian does not depend on how others treat them. Bond servants, are, are, you need to be obedient to your masters according to the flesh with fear and with trembling. But not only with fear and trembling, with sincerity of heart. Why? Because verse number five is going to tell us there, with the fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as to Christ. Okay, that sounds a lot like verse number 22 and following, doesn't it? That there is a flow through these. We are, are serving our masters just as we would serve Christ. 
And that must be absolutely with sincerity of heart. It needs to be genuine. Not with eye service as pleasures to men. I think about Matthew 23, verse number 5. What were they doing? They wanted to be seen by men. Look at me. That's not how they should be, they should be serving their masters. We cannot be that way with our masters, nor can we put on a show for others to just make believe that we are following them. If we are putting on a show to make people believe that we're following Christ, that's even worse, isn't it? As bond servants to Christ, we are doing the will of God from the heart. It ties back with verse number five. Ephesians chapter six, verse number seven. With goodwill, doing service as the Lord and not to men. Again, the, the, the eye pleasers or eye service, excuse me. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. How the master reacts, verse number eight, is going to, to speak volumes. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or the master at this time. You're still going to be judged according to the Lord by yourself. The one who does the things that they do is going to be judged. Notice that, that the Lord is not saying, you let all your slaves go. Or slaves, you need to rebel against your masters. Why? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 20. It's talking about the way they were called. It says, let each one of you remain in the same calling in which you were called. If you were free, then you're free. If you were a slave, then you're still a slave. But you know what? You're absolutely a Christian. Act like it. Friends, the Lord can use anyone in any place. But realize this. The Lord is, is laying the foundation to abolish slavery through Christianity. But when a slave treats his master with respect, unlike anything that's ever been seen, do you think questions arose? When, when a master treats his slave better than anyone has ever seen, you think questions were, were asked? Verse number nine. And you masters, you do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Your own master is in heaven, excuse me. You both serve the same master. Now that sounds much like what we've been discussing here with the Jew and the Gentile. There is no more, there, there are no longer two. You're one in Christ Jesus. Death is an equalizer, isn't it? Everyone dies. But you know what else is an equalizer? The cross. The blood of Christ is an equalizer. Here it is at the verse at the end of verse number nine, that thrust that he pertains or that he puts forth there. Therefore, or there is no partiality with him. We can look at Deuteronomy chapter ten, verse number seventeen, Acts chapter ten, verse number thirty-four, Romans chapter two, verse number eleven. God is going to judge both master and slave, and He's going to reward those who are faithful to Him. And whether they are slave or master, and he's going to punish those who willingly disobey him, whether slave or master. We as members of the blood-bought church are individuals that make up one single entity. We are being knitted together, is what the text reads in the book of Ephesians. And in that body, we have a role, don't we? We must submit to the head of the church, that is Christ. He is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. He is the savior of the body. The love that is mentioned that Christ gives, that he, he gave himself for her church. Isn't that a beautiful thing? He died so that we could be here this very evening. We would not be here today in the state of, of Christianity and, and the idea that we are saved, that we are redeemed people of God if Christ did not go to the cross and die for us. Friends, Christ sees his church as beautiful, as without spot or blemish. And Christ's love for the church is going to continue to, to lead the church. He is the head of the body. He is the, the, the husband. We are to be submissive as the body of Christ to him. What he says, we do. The body and head are not disconnected. If my head goes this way, my body goes this way. We are one entity being led by the Savior. 
Going back to chapter 5, verse number 33, we want to not miss this. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husbands. Again, we want to, to emphasize here that as the body of Christ, we are the bride of Christ. And therefore, we must be submissive to the Savior. We, we filter verses 22 through 33, and then really verses or chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, through that water filter that we've added to our backpack. We filter our lives through Scripture, or at least we should, but often we find that we, we try to filter Scripture through our lives. You know what that water filter does? It, it, it rids of the bacteria. 99.99% of bacteria is not going to get through that water. With Christ, 100% of the bacteria is not coming through. But if we're trying to filter Scripture through our lives, instead of the bad things getting caught up, it's the truth that begins to get caught up in that, that opposite filter, if you will. And it's going to be that, that we, we rid ourselves of some of this truth and some of this truth, and suddenly we are dirty again. But friends, we have been made whole through Christ. We need to be filtering our lives through Scripture. We need to be, we need to be let Scripture catch those bad things, that bacteria, that sin off of us. Get rid of it. We looked at the idea of parents and children, master and slave, husbands and wives. What great roles we have to fulfill. But we need to seek to serve God to the fullest of our capacity. Are you doing that this evening? We've added that water filter. Are you filtering your life through Scripture? Are you trying to filter Scripture through your life? We need to be doing the first. Because Scripture is the only thing that's going to matter when the day of redemption comes. It's going to be what judges us. Christ is going to come back and he's going to say, you match up with this or you don't. Where do you stand this evening? Can we help you in any way as we together stand and sing the song of invitation?